Good morning, everybody, and nice to have you all here. Um, I want to start this off with a kind of a whirlwind introduction, but but really, if you look at this this um, field that we're going to be touching into for the next few days, what you have is an enormous amount of uh, lack of rigor in terminology, and so just saying niche modeling. Well, which niche? And notice that about 62% of the papers in the field call it distribution modeling. Okay, if you insist on that terminology, which distribution? So we're kind of going to, well, I'll give you a little bit of a history, but I really want to give you kind of a, a, a taxonomy of concepts uh, related to niches and distributions. And you can disagree with the particular terminology that I'm going to use. That's fine. But at least it's explicit. At least we can argue about it instead of arguing between, you know, the, the sea is green and, and the other person says, no, 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 the sky is blue. Right? Typical useless arguments in science, which we all do. But let's, let's at least get to a little bit of rigor in, in this area. So the field kind of starts, uh, maybe that's, that's unfair, but let's, let's, let's say the modern era of the field starts with Joseph Grinnell. Um, that's a picture of him um, skinning a rat somewhere in California about a hundred and some years ago. Um, Grinnell was quite a brilliant man. If you read his work, uh, for instance, he anticipated be 50 some years in advance, he anticipated the entire theory of island biogeography. Um, but one of the crucial things that he did was also to start this, this almost GIS, uh, but this, this field of distributional ecology. So 104 years ago, he writes this paper, Niche Relationships of the California Thrasher. And uh, publishes this map, which shows you California, because that was Grinnell's universe, um, a range outline with uh, parts within the species range shown in hatching, and then occurrences shown as dots. And what Grinnell does in this paper is to kind of walk us around the distributional limit of this species and ask, what's different inside versus outside of the species range. And so, you know, he talks about in the interior of California, it does not descend b below a certain altitude. Three factors related to altitude would be barometric pressure, atmospheric density, and temperature. But then he goes elsewhere to show that the species comes down to near sea, sea level around Humboldt Bay in, in Oregon. So he throws out um, barometric pressure and atmospheric density. Anyhow, it's all pre-GIS, uh, but it's, it's fascinating thinking about distributional ecology. And in one of these publications that he did in the, in the 19 teens, he gives this list and uh, talks about factors like vegetation, food supply, rainfall, humidity, wetness, atmospheric density, blah, 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 blah. Um, okay, so my great-grandfather was an Armenian rug trader, and the best rugs were made by Muslim artists. And there's one very curious uh, feature of Muslim, especially Persian, rugs, and that's that they always have a mistake in them. And this was the idea that... Um, humans shouldn't aspire to perfection because perfection was just for God. And so even Grinnell had to have his defect. He gives us this beautiful thing of what we call now Grinnellian niche dimensions. And maybe on purpose, I'd love to think that, just like the, the Persian rug weavers, he puts in these two elements which screw the whole thing up. Um, but he talks about interspecific pressure or competition and parasitism. And so he had this beautiful list of what we now call abiotic or non-interactive uh, factors related to species distributions. And then at the very end, he throws in these two biotic or interactive 
elements. So it, it wasn't quite perfect. Um, ten years later, you get another um, fly in the soup, which is Charles Elton writes this landmark book called Animal Ecology. He recycles that term that Grinnell had invented for biology just 13, 14 years before, niche, and all of a sudden he's using it to refer to a place in the biotic environment's relations to food and enemies. And so he takes the same word which Grinnell had used for abiotic requirements, and he recycles it and uses it for kind of a role in the community. And so that confusion persists to this day. And you say niche, and about two-thirds of the ecologists in the room think one thing, and one-third of the ecologists in the room think another thing. And so that's another reason for the need for this, this kind of taxonomy of concepts. Now, don't have time to go into super detail, but I did want to show you that these ideas of niche modeling actually predate um, what we could call the modern era, you know, end of the 20th century, where all this started cooking very quickly. Um, here's a report from the Department of the Interior Fish and Wildlife Service um, on red jungle fowl, which were being considered for introduction into the southeastern U.S. to improve our biodiversity. And very interestingly, they published this map, which shows climate matching to the native range of the species in, in South Asia. And you can see that uh, the southern tier is very well matched, middling, and marginal. And essentially, uh, this was a very early niche model transfer between Asia and America. Come a little more recently, and we have to go to Mexico. Uh, this is Arturo Gomez Pompa. Um, this is back when data sets looked like this. Some of you remember this, right? <laughs> I, I could show you my not sent card. But <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I, I do have one data set that's still as, as punch cards. Uh, but this was literally, I, you know when you, when you import a data set into Excel or Access, it gives you the possibility of a delimited or a, a column delimited? Well, this is the column delimited. You used to have this map of columns one to four were your ID number, and five, six, and seven were such and such, and, and so you knew what was in each column of the data, and you only had 80 columns wide. And so this is actually a data card from one of their early uh, biodiversity records, and they had their list of factors this is a group working in Veracruz in, in eastern Mexico. And here's one of their early niche models. Okay, get this. This is the outline of the state of Veracruz. And then here's the range of our species. And then they got really high tech and put it on a screen and took pictures of the screen to, to do the publication. I'm not making fun of this. This was amazing. This was in the late 1970s, and they were doing GIS by hook or by crook. Okay, so now let's, let's kind of confront this a little bit more, more in detail. This is Tijuca atra. It's one of the rarer birds in this hemisphere. And that is its origin. That's the the uh, the book in which, or the journal in which, it was originally described. Here is the whole dis description of the species. We're interested in distribution, so what we can see is that it's from the interior of Brazil. So we can do that, right? Interior of Brazil. Well, actually. If we come forward a bit, we can get another distributional estimate that looks like this. And this is an important one because it's tied to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And so this is kind of what drives conservation action on this species. Um, but you know, even that, 
is that a good description of the range of this species? You know, if we, if we look at it, it's certainly not the interior of Brazil. It's actually very close to the coast of Brazil. But I guess if you were sitting on the shore in Rio de Janeiro, that was the interior. We can come in a little bit closer and then we can start seeing data. Okay, and we'll talk about data sources later in the day. But I did want to point out to you that data are not perfect. And so when we see something like this and then one point rather far away, we have to think very carefully about the quality of the data. Again, we'll come back to that. Um, but when we look at, here's that IUCN polygon. When we look at the known distribution of the species at the level of primary unitary data, what we see is that we have quite a bit less than what that polygon expressed. Okay? So I don't know, was there distributional continuity originally in this gap? Is there now? And you may want both or either of those answers depending on what you want out of your project. Okay, so we've got a bunch of kind of overarching challenges here. One is this pervasive incompleteness of our knowledge of species geographic distributions. That's been called the Wallacean shortfall, if you like. Um, it was kind of cute for a while, but then um, then somebody, pub I don't remember who it was, but somebody published a, a list of like 10 different shortfalls that we have, and I, it kind of took the fun out of it for me. Um, a lot of this stuff, as I showed you with the example of Tijuca, a lot of this stuff is very scale dependent. And so the distribution of a species at one scale may be a very bad dis depiction of the distribution of the same species at another scale. We definitely have to be conscious of and taking into account at all times errors and inconsistencies in the data. And then at the end of the day, what we want to do is, is get to these associations and links between where a species is and features of its environment and its landscape. Okay, And that's where we kind of get into this idea of niche modeling. Okay, so let's talk some basic concepts. And the first one we need to talk about is what we call the Hutchinsonian duality. Um, that's a couple different maps of the world. Um, in this case, a map of temperature and a map of precipitation. Um, and species respond, the idea of this duality is that they respond to both the geography and the environment. And so just as kind of a fun exercise, which actually becomes an important exercise, I'm going to throw a bunch of random points on the Earth, the terrestrial part of the Earth. Um, and I'm going to look at their environmental characteristics. So I took those points and I extracted to them the values of precipitation and temperature. And you can do this in lots of dimensions. And I get this interesting um, environmental spread. This is about as regular and normal looking as they ever get. But I want you to notice high density, a gap, low density, an arm that goes up, some scatter. Usually when you do these, you get things that look like amoebas. Okay, they're very irregular. They're never you know, multivariate normal or anything like that. So that's going to be kind of an overriding um, characteristic of this, of this environment in which we're going to work. And so when we look at the geography and the environment, this is kind of what species have to do too. They have to maintain a geographic range, and the geographic range to which they are somehow restricted has to have conditions that are adequate for the species to maintain its populations. So translating it slightly, 
we have to have conditions within the fundamental ecological niche represented on the area that is accessible to the species in geography. And if we don't have both the geography and the conditions, we don't have the species. So let's talk a little bit about um, distributions of species. And this is kind of a, a curious thing. Until about the year 2000, there was no really rigorous thinking about distributional areas as opposed to uh, kind of more theoretical discussions of ecological niche. And so Ron Pulliam in the year 2000 publishes a, a landmark paper. I don't feel like it got as much attention as it deserved. 2005, Jorge Soberon and I published kind of a, an echo of Pulliam uh, that got a little bit more attention because we made it a little more explicit and we've, we've kind of tied back to it in a lot of subsequent work. But I'm going to use this as a way of giving you kind of a, a taxonomy of, of distributions. Okay, So we have this kind of maximum area of interest, which is G. Okay, And that might be the whole world, it might be the whole universe, or it might be something more specific, you know, a continent or an island. But kind of whatever is relevant to your, your taxon. Now, we'll talk about fundamental ecological niches in just a moment. But let's just say that we have some set of conditions that in Grinnell's world, in those physical, abiotic, non-interactive dimensions, with those conditions, our species can maintain populations. Okay? So we'll talk about the, the shape of that in environmental space, but right now we're in ge geographic space. We're on one side of the Hutchinsonian duality. And so if we just ask, what are the areas that present the right set of physical conditions? Well, we get some area that we'll call A. Now, one of the big mistakes that Jorge and I made in this uh, paper was in using well, the mistake wasn't in using a Venn diagram. The mistake was in using kind of regular shapes because it really doesn't feel like you're looking at a map. So we should have done something more squiggly and more irregular, and it probably would have avoided some confusion. But we can take this area that essentially maps from the fundamental ecological niche and call it A for abiotic, okay? And I want you to notice that, and this is a really crucial thing, that mapping is one directional. You have the fundamental niche, and you can use that to identify the suitable area A, but you can't use A to identify the fundamental ecological niche. And you'll see why in a moment. 
Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, good. I thought that was a subtle microphone, but I trust it in Tennessee technology. So invasive species basically prove this, this general outline because, for example, via human help, you increase the mobility area, the accessible area, and all of a sudden the distribution gets larger, okay? And that's because all the conditions are right and in place and sitting there, and all you have to do is change the access. Now, again, the big mistake we made was in, in putting these as regular circles with this nice um, even area of overlap. And so right away, um, we started thinking about, well, what are the the different configurations of these three circles. And so one thing that we, that we folded into this was essentially how we were all taught about niche and distribution in our basic ecology classes. And we're a little bit uh, mean-spirited uh, in, in these names, but it's, it's all meant in fun. I have offended some people with this, but we call this Hutchinson's dream. Mona was part of, of applying these names years and years ago. But essentially, Hutchinson's world was one in which the fundamental ecological niche and the, the interactions with other species determined the distributional and environmental potential of the species. And so in Hutchinson's world, in some sense, M, the access circle, was large and therefore wasn't a constraint. Now, of course, we're all kind of, anybody know who this is? All right, Alfred Russell Wallace. We're all kind of aware of the fact that biogeography exists. And so Wallace did this incredible journey. It was a, it was a, a circumnavigation, but in particular, he does this, this um, this very intricate route around um, what we call Sundaland, and he discovers this amazing break in fauna, I think it's right here, which we now call Wallace's Line in his honor. And so Wallace might see the world very differently where these abiotic and biotic interactions aren't so, as Im so important as insularity and, and, and uh, dispersal limitation, okay? And so we call that Wallace's dream or Wallace's world. Um, so we have to think very carefully about these because some species fit into each of these categories. And we'll talk briefly later in the course about how crucial that is to the success of niche modeling efforts. Now let's do one more kind of fun play, which is kind of a challenge that, uh, that a bunch of us put out a few years ago to the idea of the importance of biotic interactions, I'm gonna be specific, at geographic extents. Okay, obviously, clearly, competition happens. There are interactions among species on local extents. Clearly, there are some cases where species interactions are manifested and have influences on geographic extents. But this idea of Eltonian noise hypothesis is the idea that under many circumstances, if not most circumstances, biotic interactions are not direct and do not mold the geographic distributions of species. I know everybody's like this with me, oh come on. Is he really gonna say that? It's a hypothesis, okay? And I just last year published a paper refuting it for one particular case. But it's an idea and it's meant to get people thinking. Okay, so all I'm trying to show you is that there are different configurations of the BAM diagram, different configurations of abiotic, biotic, and movement factors, and that we need to take those different configurations into account. Okay, now we're gonna jump over into the environmental space. We're gonna go to the other half of the Hutchinsonian duality. Um, and we need to think very carefully about this. 
not enough time to go into this, but we're going to make the basic assumption that uh, this fundamental ecological niche is probably multivariate in nature, which is to say a species doesn't respond to just a single environmental dimension, that, which is to say there's some complexity involved. And so we're going to call the fundamental ecological niche N sub F, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to then look at how we see different portions and subsets of it based on what is available to the species and what factors are affecting its, its distribution. So let me walk you through this in equation, which is a little, bit, a little bit messy. The most inclusive thing is the fundamental niche. So you can think of the fundamental niche as some probably convex shape. We'll talk about that in the afternoon. Um, and it gets reduced. Now, Hutchinson would have talked immediately about competition. I'm not going to talk about competition yet. Instead, a subset of the fundamental niche is this N sub F star, which we're going to call the existing niche. And that is the portion of the fundamental niche that is represented within M. Okay, within the accessible area. Okay, so you can see this notation as the fundamental niche intersected with, and then this operator eta is the environments corresponding to M. Okay, so you remember I told you that mapping between geographic and environmental space is one directional, right? We can go from the fundamental niche and identify the parts of geography that are habitable by our species. But if we come back from environmental, sp from geographic space to environmental space, we get a smaller set. Okay, and that's because not all of the fundamental niche is represented on the crucial landscapes to our species. Okay, so the existing niche is a subset of the fundamental. Now there's a further reduction. This is just a, a, a set theory way of stating the BAM diagram. There's a further reduction, which is by the environments associated with uh, the, the biotic world, reducing the existing fundamental niche to the realized niche. All we're trying to say here is that this, the fundamental niche, is rather hard to observe. Even in an easy world where the Eltonian noise hypothesis holds, we still have this problem where this is what we can easily observe, and this is what we care about. And so our problem is that the environments associated with M are not broadly representative. And so this, kind of, this, this really becomes the, the driver of a lot of the methodological problems in distributional ecology, okay? If we have time, I can point some of them out to you. Let me give you an example of this. An invasive species called spotted knapweed has a distribution where we could posit M areas like this, native distribution in Europe, invaded distribution in the Western uh, United States. And I'm not showing you anything that's data from the species, but that's what drove me to build these two polygons. These are the environments of Europe in blue and of um, North America in red. And let's just imagine that this ellipse is the fundamental niche of this, spe of this species. Notice that the centroid of this species occurrence in America is down here, and in Europe it's up there. 
And that's basically saying that in the European distributional area, only that part of this niche is represented. And in the American part of this distributional area, most of the representation of this niche is down here. There's scattered representation up there. Does that make sense? So we come back to this equation. And I just want to give you one example of why this is important. One very common thing that we'll do in distributional ecology is ask whether species one and species two, whatever they may be, have the same fundamental niche. And unless you do detailed physiological experiments, you should answer, well, I can't answer that question without asking what are the environments accessible to each of our species. So it's not a question of whether fundamental niche one and fundamental, fun, fundamental niche two are equivalent, but rather whether fundamental niche one, given its available set of environments, is equal to fundamental niche two, given its set of available environments. OK? So that, that inequality or that, that equation that I gave you just a moment ago, it actually drives a lot of the methodologies that we have to use. OK, so I've given you kind of an overview, but I haven't given you the specifics. I want to go through the two um, spaces and the kind of key concepts within them. So in environmental space, we have these manifestations that we can call fundamental niches. This is the set of environmental conditions in which the species can maintain populations in the long term without immigrational subsidy. We'll make these presentations available to you guys so you don't have to write them down madly. We'll have them in a folder for you somewhere. The reduction of the fundamental niche by access is the existing niche. And the further reduction of the existing niche by biotic interactions is the realized niche. And then other things we need to be aware of are the environmental characteristics of known occurrences of our, of our species and environmental characteristics of the area sampled. We could also do environmental characteristics of M, which turns out to be pretty important as well. And then we have, in the geographic dimension, we have these key areas of M, the accessible area, obviously A and B, the other two pieces of the BAM diagram, where A and B overlap is the potential distribution. It's essentially the geographic area that the species could occupy if access were universal. We have the three-way overlap of B, A, and M, which we can call the occupied or actual distribution. We're going to use this notation to signify essentially the sites where the species is known. And then the part of the potential distribution that's not within the actual distribution is the invadable distribution. So that's not all of the niches and distributions that we could talk about, but it's kind of some of the more important ones. Accessible area is essentially the dispersal reach of the species over relevant periods of time, OK? And that's frequently going to include areas that are not part of the potential distribution of our species. The potential distribution of the species is where the conditions are all right. So abiotic and biotic work for the species. And essentially, if the species can get there, it can establish and maintain populations, OK? So just to be clear, 
when you present this as a Venn diagram, it looks like three independent factors. Frequently, they're not. For example, a virus that's being hosted by some, let's say, vertebrate host, its M may be a function of its B, right? Its accessible area may be a function of its host. Okay, so one point is that these are not independent factors in the real world, and another is we would love to take the entirety of the BAM diagram and translate all of that into uh, mathematical treatments of essentially the effects of each of these factors, be they other species or be they environments, um, on on populations of the species, which is to say, this is very typological and very heuristic. Okay, it's not comprehensive. Uh, Jorge Soberon, we all make fun of him with his, in Spanish, equacioncitas, um, because you know he has notebooks and notebooks full of how he's translating each element of this into formal mathematical treatment. Um, but I think more importantly is let's at least get the same set of terms. So if we don't have the same set of terms, we're not speaking the same language and we're not going to communicate very effectively. Other questions? <laughs>